I want you to imagine driving down a remote road in Vermont. It's autumn. The sun is setting. So the world is on fire. The trees are an explosive red and orange. Their branches reach into the pink crimson sky above. Those colors, they're all so vivid. Like they could last forever. But night always comes. Swift and decisive. It chases the sherbet tapestry away with shadows. Soon, it's just you on the highway alone in the darkness with nothing to keep you company but your thoughts. That's where I was in the fall of 96 on a desolate stretch of I-89 in Vermont trying to clear my mind. See, I'd been in Burlington for a gig, a film shoot, and I got fired. First time it ever happened to me. Of course, it wouldn't be the last. In my line of work, I go through just as much famine as I do feast. But back then, it was still new. And I was feeling pretty bad about it. Like I'd never work again. So there I was, driving, feeling worried and defeated. As day turned to night. And I saw something down a dirt road that split from the highway was a cluster of cabins, summer resort maybe, because it seemed deserted. A sign at the entrance said, Maple Tree Lodges. There was a bench right beside it. Looked like a nice, quiet spot. They called to me, you know. So I pulled over, got out, and took a seat. Watched the last of daylight fade from the sky. I was so engrossed, it took me a minute to notice. Someone was on the bench with me man in his 30s. No idea how long he'd been there. He said his name was Peter. He apologized if it startled me, but this was his spot. He came there sometimes, all the way from Burlington. It was the only place he could think. Now I was in one of those really vulnerable states. A stick could have asked me to spill on that wood. So it took about two seconds for me to tell Peter everything. The job, my panic, my self-loathing. It was word vomit, the messy kind. But when I finished, Peter seemed thoughtful. Said he had a story if I wanted to hear. Sure did. Given everything, I was happy to take a break from my own chaotic thoughts and hear someone else's. That's when Peter told me he knew all about those kind of feelings of self-worth and defeat because he remembered the first time he got fired. It coincided with another life moment. Peter was talking about the night he died. You're listening to Run Fool. I'm Rodney Barnes, and this is episode 48. The Black Eyed Children. Look, I wasn't in the best headspace, but I wasn't screwed up enough to be seeing dead people. Turned out, Peter didn't mean he died in the literal sense. Disappointed? Well, Reserve your judgment until after I've finished, because Peter didn't exactly get off lightly. Peter's story starts about five years back, when he was driving up the snow-clogged mountain passes of Vermont, admiring the pristine white snow, the way the sun bounced off it, glimmered like a blanket of jewels. He glanced at the passenger seat where his girlfriend Veronica sat. She stared at the map in her lap, directing him. Then she looked up and grinned. They were almost there. Peter tried to smile back, but it was tough. Even though he was surrounded by amazing scenery and had an incredible girlfriend by his side, he couldn't smile because he didn't feel like he deserved any of it. See, Peter had lost his job. It was a small job at a small company, which always made him feel small. And that feeling got worse when they let him go. It had been six months, and he still hadn't found another gig. Look, 
As outdated as it is, there's that old feeling some of us have. We gotta be providers. Not that I agree with that sentiment, but that doesn't mean it's not there. And when you can't do that, it makes you feel all sorts of defeated. So, Peter was pretty down on himself. And lately there had been this voice in his head making him feel worse. Telling him he was no good, worthless, incapable of success. Veronica cut in, interrupting his bad thoughts. She said to take the next left. Veronica had planned this whole weekend. A trip away to a wintry wonderland to lift his spirits. He should have felt grateful. But honestly, it just made him ashamed. Veronica told him to turn left again. He steered the car onto a snow-streaked dirt road. Seconds later, their home for the weekend came into view. Yeah, Maple Tree Lodges. The place yours truly stopped to take a breather. It was a series of about six cabins, all cute brown squares with their roofs covered in fluffy snow. Looked kind of like cotton balls. They were spread out around a large clearing, which butted up against thick woods. Like I said, this place was a summertime spot popular with the fishing, camping crowds. It was technically open for biz all year round, but no one really came during the winter, and right now, it looked deserved. As if reading his mind, Veronica said, we have the whole place to ourselves. Peter forced a smile. He parked by their cabin, just in time, too. The sun was sinking fast, filling the sky with an aggressive pop of color stark against the white world below. As he got out of the car, his eyes drifted to the woods. The trees were dense and heavy with snow. He was about to look away when he noticed something. It looked like a person. It was hard to tell from where Peter stood. He squinted. It was a figure, standing among the trees, still as a statue. They were facing away from him. As he stared, the figure's head slowly turned around. The car trunk slammed. Veronica had unloaded their bags and was hauling them to the cabin. Peter glanced back at the figure, but it was gone. Now, if it were me, I'd wonder if it was real, for at least a second. But Peter was so disgusted with himself, his first thought was he'd imagined it because there was something wrong with him. Before he could berate himself even more, Veronica took his hand. Peter shoved his car keys into his pocket and allowed her to lead him inside. The interior was a big, open living area with a fireplace. There was a comfy couch covered in furs, a tiny kitchenette, a narrow hallway split off from the roomy area, lined with doors to the bedrooms. It was, in a word, delightful. Even Peter could admit that. After they settled in, Peter poured some wine and sat on the couch with Veronica. It didn't say much, just stared out of the window at the moon. It was full and had that very specific bluish-yellow hue, the kind of color that only the moon can put out. It lit up the blanket of snow outside, making the whole landscape glow. It felt like they were on a different planet. Peter tore his eyes away to look at Veronica. She smiled back. Man, she was so lovely. Generous, kind, and supportive. She deserved a better partner. He was unemployed, unhappy, a waste of her time. He wondered if he should just do the right thing and let her go. Then Veronica took his hand. She said there was another reason she planned this weekend. She had to tell him something. She was pregnant. Peter froze. He stared at Veronica, mind whirling, stomach in knots, both from the greatest joy he'd ever felt and an aching, visceral terror. He wanted to say something, but he couldn't, because there was that voice screaming in his head, saying he wasn't even capable of supporting himself. He was a failure as a person. He'd be a failure as a dad, too. So he just sat there while Veronica slowly deflated, hurt by his silence. 
which made Peter feel worse, which made the bad thoughts worse, which he suddenly noticed Veronica wasn't looking at him anymore. She stared out the window, a deep frown etched in her brow. She said, there's someone outside. Your nighttime bedroom temperature has a huge impact on your sleep quality. If you wake up too hot or too cold, I highly recommend you check out Miracle Made's bed sheets. Miracle Made sheets are inspired by NASA and use silver infused fabrics that are temperature regulating so you can sleep at the perfect temperature all night long. These sheets are infused with silver that prevent up to 99.7% of bacterial growth, leaving them to stay cleaner and fresh three times longer than other sheets. No more gross odors. Using silver-infused fabrics inspired by NASA, Miracle Made sheets are thermoregulating and designed to keep you at the perfect temperature all night long, no matter the weather, so you get better sleep every night. Go to trymiracle.com slash run to try Miracle Made sheets today. And whether you're buying them for yourself or as a gift for a loved one, if you order today, you can save over 40%. And if you use our promo RUN at checkout, you'll get three free towels and save an extra 20%. Miracle is so confident in their product, it's back with a 30-day money-back guarantee. So if you aren't 100% satisfied, you'll get a full refund. Upgrade your sleep with Miracle Made. Go to trymiracle.com slash run and use the code RUN to claim your free three-piece towel set and save over 40% off. Again, that's trymiracle.com slash run to treat yourself. Thank you, Miracle Made, for sponsoring this episode. What does possible sound like for your business? It's the ability to reach further with access to over 1,400 lounges worldwide. Redefine possible with Business Platinum. That's the powerful backing of American Express. Terms and conditions apply. Visit Amex.ca slash Business Platinum. Peter followed Veronica's gaze, but he couldn't see much. Even with the moonlight, it was pretty dark. He asked what she'd seen. She didn't know exactly. Just that there was a shape running from the woods. It went around the front of the house. They sat there in tense silence, watching the night, waiting. Then, all the lights went out, plunging them into darkness. They looked at one another, confused. Peter reached over to flip a lamp switch, one of those instinctive reactions. You know the power is out, but you gotta flip a switch anyway. Of course, the light didn't come on. Veronica suggested they find the breaker box. Peter nodded. Why didn't he think of that? He stood, ready to go hunt for it, when a muffled, agonized moan ripped through the quiet. Someone was crying, a desperate kind of whimper. It came from outside, by the front steps. It sounded like a child. Peter's heart pounded. That couldn't be right. There shouldn't be anyone out here, let alone a kid. The grounds were empty and the last house he saw was at least ten minutes up the road by car. Maybe another family had come after they'd arrived. But wouldn't they have seen the headlights or something? The sobbing moan came again. They looked towards the front door. Then, a new sound filled the cabin. A quiet, steady scraping. Nails on wood. Scratch, scratch, scratch. Another pitiful cry followed, definitely a child's. Peter's mouth went dry, because he was feeling something strange, a bubbling ache in his belly. Dread. A simple order popped into his mind. Don't open the door. But, yikes, he was going to be a dad, and his first instinct was to ignore a crying child, as if he needed any more proof he wasn't capable. Before he could sort out what to do, Veronica strode to the door and opened. The air chilled as the freeze rushed in. The night outside was dark, lit only by the moon. The steps were empty. Veronica called out, asking if anyone was there, but there was no answer. 
She turned to Peter and asked if he could go look. She do it herself, but her jacket was in one of the bedrooms. He still had his on. Peter winced. He should have suggested that. He stepped outside and hovered on the steps. The biting cold chapped his face almost instantly. He peered into the night. It seemed deserted. But then, as his eyes adjusted, he saw a small childlike hand reached out of the moonlight streaked darkness. Its fingers were spread wide, as if trying to grab onto him. Peter gasped, startled. He was about to dash back inside when... A figure emerged from the gloom. It was a girl. She had to be around six or so. He could make out her thin, trembling shoulders, covered by a gray hoodie, pulled all the way up. So her face was in shadow. Peter just gaped at her. His mouth went dry. That dread clawed at him from inside his chest. Veronica's voice came from behind. Jesus, Peter, let her in. He blinked, woken up by Veronica's words. Man, he felt like a jerk then. He stepped aside and said, Please, come in. As soon as he did, the girl hurried up the steps and across the threshold. He closed the door behind her. Veronica grabbed a blanket from the back of the couch and threw it around the girl's shoulders, told her to take a seat. The girl sank into the sofa cushions. Her whole body shook as she clutched the blanket. She looked so vulnerable. Veronica spoke softly to her, asking where she came from, where her parents were. The girl didn't answer. She just stared straight ahead, shivering. Then she turned towards Peter, and he heard a high-pitched mocking voice say, Peter, Peter, in the muck. Peter, Peter, always stuck. It was the strangest thing. It seemed to come from the girl, but it also didn't. Like it was in his head, only it was way more visceral than his normal bad thoughts. Veronica's voice cut in, told him to try the phone lines, see if they could get in touch with anyone. It seemed like she hadn't heard the voice. Peter didn't even know if he had. The girl was sitting there, like nothing had happened. Peter, can you? Veronica seemed annoyed. He hurried to the kitchen, grateful for an excuse to step away. The landline hung on the wall just above a light switch. He grabbed the receiver. It was dead. Crap. He hung it back on his cradle, then went back over to the couch. And what he saw made his whole body seize. Moonlight filtered in through the windows bathing Veronica and the girl in an extraterrestrial bluish glow. And the girl had her hand on Veronica's stomach. Her small fingers were stretched wide over the belly, almost possessive. Veronica sat there, rigid and tense. She looked up at Peter with a whiff of fear. Before Peter knew what he was doing, he reached out and shoved the girl's hand away. Veronica gasped, Peter! The girl burst into tears, pitiful, terrified sobs. It raked at Peter's heart. Wow, she was just a kid. Why do you have to react like that? He said he was sorry, but her tiny shoulders shook harder and harder. Then she raised her quivering chin so that she was looking right at him. The power suddenly popped back on, which meant that he could finally see the girl's face. It was sweet tiny features, a red button mouth, chubby cheeks. She was almost like a doll, except her tear-filled eyes were pitch black. As in no whites, no irises, just two bottomless inkwells where I should be. Once Peter's brain caught up with what he was seeing, that good old friend named Fear hit him. Hard. He yelped and staggered back, chipping over the coffee table. His elbow smashed into the floor. Tailbone did too. A flurry of pain ricocheted through his body. He felt Veronica's hands trying to help him up. He was on his feet in seconds, just as. The lights went up, again. His ragged breathing filled the quiet room as he stared at the couch, which was now empty. A soft pattern of feet came from the corridor off the kitchen. Peter's head shot towards the sound, panicked. 
How had the girl gotten over there? Seconds ago, she'd been in front of him, with eyes that had no business being on a human's face. But when he said as much out loud, Veronica seemed confused. Uh, what eyes? Peter felt the color drain from his face. Right. So, Veronica hadn't seen the black eyes. She hadn't heard the taunting voice. Now Peter had to wonder. Was he hallucinating? Veronica must have sensed his anxiety, because she demanded to know what was going on. He barely said a word since she told him about the baby, and now he was acting weird, when there was a kid who needed them. She said, I wonder if you're cut out for this. See, there's a line. You can think all sorts of bad things about yourself, and still function. But if the person you love says the same crap you've been thinking, that feels wretched. So yeah, all Peter could come up with was, I'm just tired. Oof, Veronica sighed. Said she was going to go find the girl. Poor thing was probably freaked. Peter hesitated, then followed, not knowing what else to do. The corridor was dark. The floorboard shifted under their feet, sending loud creaks through the cabin. Veronica called out to the girl and stuck her head in one of the rooms. She looked back at Peter. Empty, she said. Then went on to the next one. Peter moved to a different room and peered inside. It was pitch black in there, so he entered with his hands outstretched, feeling around as he went. He brushed against the bed, then a dresser. It was a tiny room, so that was pretty much it. He heard the floor creak behind him, the trout of footsteps. Veronica. He said this room was empty, too. She sighed and rubbed his back. It made him melt a little, you know, because it felt like an olive branch. Maybe she wasn't so disgusted with him after all. Then he heard Veronica call out to the girl again. But she did it from the hallway outside, which meant... Whoever was in the room with him was not Veronica. Peter lunged for the window, yanked up the shade. The moonlight spilled in, illuminating the figure that stood behind him. It was the girl, looking out at him from the shadows. The moonlight caught her cheeks, her forehead, but the eyes, they swallowed up any light that hit them. Vacant, endless holes. They weren't just darkness. They were eating the darkness. The black around her rippled against some unseen magnetic power. Then, she changed. That's the only way to describe it. Her eyes stayed black as coal, but her face transformed, going from girl to baby to young woman to old woman, then back to girl, the story of a life. Peter felt something then, a pang of longing. Because despite the horror he felt, there was something beautiful there. Of seeing someone start at the beginning and become a person, he might like to be part of something like that. As if in answer to this thought, the girl opened her mouth as wide as it could go and laughed. A wild, cackling kind of laugh that spewed from the back of her throat. She was laughing at Peter mocking him for even thinking of being a parent. It was a joke. Not good enough for Veronica. Not good enough to father a child. He was trash. A scream tore through the air. Peters, barreling out of his throat like a damn opera song. It wasn't just fear. This scream, it was pain. A verbal expression of all the rancid, corrupting anguish that infected him. Veronica ran in and stopped short. The girl whipped around to face her, mouth agape, that devilish mirth still exploding from her throat. Then she hissed. You could run. It might be fun. Veronica lunged forward, grabbed Peter's hand, and shot towards the hall. They hurtled down the corridor to the front door. Veronica yanked it open. A blast of frigid air hit his face. Cold flakes kissed his cheeks as they ran down the steps. It was snowing, not just snowing, storming. The flakes came down in a heavy, swirling curtain, 
By the time they got to the car, Peter couldn't feel his face. He couldn't feel much of anything. Just the icy numbness and the pressure of the wind as it raked over his chapped skin. His lungs burned raw as the freeze clawed down his throat. Veronica screamed for the keys. For a moment, he thought he'd left them in the house. But he shoved a hand into his coat pocket and melted with relief. The keys. He pulled them out and fumbled. They flew out of his hand and into the snow. He and Veronica froze. Their eyes traveled from Peter's hand to the pile of white at his feet. Then, without even thinking twice, Veronica dove. Her hands raked the drift, getting more and more frantic with each passing second. Peter glanced back at the house. The little girl stood in the doorway, spotlit by moonlight, like she was on a stage. Some kind of lethal prima donna waiting to make her entrance. Veronica shouted at Peter to help. He tore his eyes away from the girl and sank to his knees, hands deep in the snow, desperately hoping to hit cold metal. He got so into his task he almost didn't notice Veronica had stopped. She was looking over his shoulder. He turned. A stretch of lawn sat between them and the woods. His view was obscured by snowfall and darkness, but even so, Peter could make out a shape by tree line. A small figure. Then some movement from the woods beside it. More childlike silhouettes emerged. A thought occurred to Peter, a random one. He'd heard a legend about coyotes once. How if you see one, it means they're more nearby, waiting unseen. The one you see is just a scout, sent ahead to lure prey back to its pack. That girl, she'd been the scout. She didn't just want to get into the house. She wanted them to come out. Veronica seemed to realize the same thing, because she whimpered. Her face was etched in that deep kind of fear, the kind that paralyzes you, way more than the cold. For once, she didn't offer a plan. She didn't have one. Terror ruled. The children ran towards them. Their little legs took big leaps in the snow. As they ate up the distance between the woods and the car, their arms stretched out like they were offering a hug. Despite this bone-chilling scene, Peter locked on to something else, another cabin, the one closest to theirs. What happened next went by in an instant. See, Peter realized that was their only shot at refuge, and as soon as this occurred to him, those bad thoughts rose up, telling him he couldn't make it, that it was probably locked, that he shouldn't even try. But this time he shoved them down. Instead, He grabbed Veronica's hand. He could hear her sobbing as he pulled her up and raced towards the cabin. The running children called after them, pleading with him to wait. Their little voices were desperate, designed to tug at the heartstrings, to make Peter doubt himself. He ran and ran and ran, and suddenly his hand was grabbing the cabin's door, turning the knob. It opened. He and Veronica tumbled inside. He whipped around to shut the door. It was too late. The kids were upon them. They filled the frame. Wide obsidian eyes peered inside. But that was it. They didn't enter. They gathered in the doorway, feet just behind the cabin threshold. Their palms slapped the door frame. Their little voices called out, begging to be let in. Peter remembered how the girl had hovered outside, how she hadn't come in until he asked her to. The realization struck him like a bolt of lightning. They had to be invited. That's why they turned off the power and sent one of their own ahead to chase them out because they couldn't just get in. Something occurred to Peter then. You know, all this self-sabotage he'd been doing, those mean, disorienting thoughts, he'd been letting those in, welcoming them to pollute his mind and confuse him. But he didn't have to do that. Because the one time he refused to let them take over, he knew exactly what to do. Peter put an arm around Veronica and pulled her close. He buried his face in her hair. Then he said the thing he should have said hours ago, but the bad thoughts got in the way. The simplest thing in the world. I love you. Both of you. He and Veronica sat there all night. 
the children did too, silently watching them the whole time with their vacant stares till day broke and they disappeared into thin air. After that, a new Peter took Veronica's hand and walked out into the cold morning. Peter smiled. At least I think he did. It gotten pretty dark by that point. The moonlight made his eyes sparkle. I could feel a sense of certainty emanating from him, like he'd somehow figured out all life's answers and was pleased this punch that he had. See, when Peter told me he died that night, he meant a part of him had. The old Pete, who'd held himself back because he couldn't see the good. He'd let the bad take up too much room. That girl was the embodiment of all the rancid cruelty he spewed at himself. But that kind of terror, it doesn't have to come in. You can shut the door and let yourself be alone with the good things. That's when you realize just how capable you are. Peter told me he'd welcomed his son nine months later. He and Veronica were still going strong. He'd even started his own business. Could I believe that? And whenever the negativity started to creep back in, he came here to Maple Tree Lodges to remind himself of the evil he encountered and all the good that came of it. I looked up at the sky. The moon was bright. It reminded me of Peter's story, which made me shiver. It was time to go. I thanked him for the chat, then hurried to my car. Look, I didn't know what the future would hold. If I get another job, I'll have to move back in with my grandma in Maryland. But at the time, I wasn't thinking about any of that. All I knew was that I didn't want to linger at Maple Tree Lodges. I had my friends and a pretty good therapist who'd help me find my confidence again. I didn't need help from a pack of evil children. Run Fool is a production of Ballin Studios, Campside Media, and Atwell Media. It is hosted and executive produced by me, Rodney Barnes. This episode was written by Kate Murdoch and produced by Abakar Adan and Lane Rose. Editing by Abakar Adan. Sound director, designer, and mixer is Kevin Seaman. Coordinating producer is Avery Siegel. And artwork by Jessica Clarkston Tyner. Special thanks to Sequoia Thomas. Production support by Jeremy Bone and Cole Lacasio. Special thanks to our operations team, Doug Slaywin, Ashley Warren, Sabina Mara, and Destiny Dingle. Executive producers at Ballin Studios are Mr. Ballin, Nick Witters, and Zach Levin. Executive producer at At Will Media is Will Malnati. Executive producers at Campside Media are Matt Scher, Josh Dean, Vanessa Gregoriadis, and Adam Hoff. Thanks for listening, and see you next week.